anatta, not self. And there's a true hallmark of the teaching of the Buddha. Now that is uh, one aspect which you, to the best of my knowledge, which you cannot find in any other religion, philosophy, spiritual system. So it's a really important point of Dhamma. It's unique. It's a hallmark of the Buddha Dhamma. However, I like to start now with a little misunderstanding because many people think the teaching is no self. Many people think the Buddha was teaching that there is no self. Is that what anyone believes? Well, that is quite common. There's a slight distortion. And uh, I would be very appreciative if you feel the Buddha was teaching that there is no self, if you can show me a single quote where the Buddha would actually ever say that literally like that. There's in fact uh, one passage where the Buddha is asked point blank, is there a self or is there no self? And he simply refuses to answer because he felt if he would agree with either of these two positions, it wouldn't be beneficial and wouldn't lead that person for letting go and to realize Nibbana. Vajra Gotta, the wanderer Vajra Gotta, now asking the Buddha on that. There's another quote in Sabhasava Sutta, where the Buddha explicitly says that to hold to the view I have a self, or to hold to the view I do not have a self. The both is called a wilderness of views, a thicket of views, a wasteland of views. It will not get us out of suffering. So what is the Buddha truly teaching? He's teaching all phenomena are not self. So you may say this is maybe hair splitting, whether I say there is no self, or whether I say all phenomena are not self, this is the same. And it's somewhat similar, but it's actually not quite the same. If I say that there is no self, first of all, you're establishing a kind of view, you're establishing a doctrine. And you will immediately clash with everyone who is convinced that there is a self. You merely have got that conflict. If you say all phenomena are not safe, that is more a meditation technique, that is a tool, that's a method to extricate yourself from the delusion of self. It's also much more helpful, it's practical. It's applicable. For example, you may have a major operation coming up. Maybe painful, there may be in a danger, maybe somewhat dangerous. So you're feeling a bit scary and not quite sure what's going to happen. Will I fully recover? Will it all work out? Now you're facing this big operation. And now I come to you and I tell you, by the way, there is no self. Would that really help? Would that really make a big difference about the issue you have? They have this big operation coming up. Or someone is going maybe through an acrimonious divorce. It can be quite traumatic. And then you go up to them and you say, by the way, there is a safe. Would that really help them? It's just uh, another construct which you want to put on top of all the other mental constructs and thoughts and ideas and theories and which we already carry around with us. On the other hand, if someone goes into an operation and you suggest and contemplate, the body is not really yourself. This is something which is effective, which is beneficial. It helps. 
And if we contemplate the body as not me, not mine, not myself, you will go into the operation a much more light-hearted. So there's a little bit of different emphasis. To just postulate that there is no self, it's just an idea. What the Buddha does is usually applying it to a very specific phenomenon. And he has also said that all phenomena are not safe, but much more common is that he explicitly points out this is not the safe. For example, the body. For example, feeling. Pleasant, unpleasant. Is not safe. Because it's meant as a tool. It's meant to be used that we can let go of feeling, that we can let go of the body. And we should also explain uh, the way it is used. And it's like self with a capital S in the beginning. And uh, for the ancient Indians, you know, a true self, a true utter, is a little bit what we would call you know, the eternal blissful soul. You know, the idea was you know, that the true self is unchanging, eternal, and blissful. You will notice when the Buddha you know, argues about or explains about self and letting go. Now, that is usually the assumption which people had. So it's somewhat similar to what people nowadays would say, you know, their eternal blissful soul, maybe in theistic religions, you know, the, after you die, you know, your soul will be going to God and be for, forever blissful, you know, eternally blissful soul with God. The teachings like that. It doesn't refer so much you know, to uh, everyday usage like I went there myself. I didn't see her myself. I just heard about her. It's not so much meant for them as meant for this uh, substantial, lasting, and blissful soul-like entity. The other thing is that self is always connected with I, me, and mine. Self is always connected with acquisitions, appropriating, getting, holding, having something. Atta and Ataniya in Pali. The moment you postulate a self, that self must have something, always goes together. The moment you operate with self, and then you also have an I and me and mine and appropriating. So they stand and fall together. And we can see you know, that there's nothing that we own than the delusion of self collapses. If the delusion of self collapses, you know, then we also see that we cannot truly own anything. In the end, there's no point arguing about is there a safe or is there no safe, because it depends on each individual whether we generate and maintain the delusion of safe, because that is what is there. It's a little bit different from anicca, impermanent. It's a little bit more objective. Can't really argue so much on whether the flowers are permanent or impermanent. They just come back in two weeks' time and immediately appear when they are impermanent. You can kind of objectively assess that. But whether a person regards something as safe, whether a person regards something as mine, 
whether someone sees themselves as the owner is not something which you can objectively determine because it is subjectively done by that person. So rather getting into a kind of pseudo-objective argument, there's objectively no self, there's objectively a self existing. Now the Buddha points to the process how our mind creates the delusion of self, how our mind creates the delusion of ownership, our mind creates a delusion of na I, I am. And then once I am, then I have to do something and I have to own something. And the typical areas where that delusion is built on is, for example, you know, the doer and the thinker. We talked about that you know, with one of the retreatants just recently. And people usually have very strong illusion you know, that I am the one who is thinking. You know, behind the eyes, here in the, in the brain, I'm in there and doing all this thinking, and this is me, isn't it? That's what you probably think, no? <laughs> and one other quality of self and ownership is control. And it doesn't really make sense not to say, I own something if I have zero control about it. What would you say if I tell you that uh, I own the moon? The moon belongs to me, it's my, it's my property. Sounds pretty ludicrous, it sounds, sounds pretty lunatic. <laughs> if someone claims now that they own the moon, why? I can't even get there, I can't touch it, I can't influence it, I can't do anything with it, I have zero control. So it's immediately apparent that if I claim that I personally own the moon, it's my property, the, the delusion is apparent. On the other hand, the people claim that I am the thinker, Manta Hamasni. So if you're truly the thinker, then you should be able to control what you think. If thinking is yourself, you should be able, and that's the idea of a whole self, you should be able to then think what you want. So please do not think about a pink elephant. Do not think about the pink elephant. Please do not get an image or an idea of this pink elephant. My guess is that probably most of you are thinking about a pink elephant right now, isn't it? Can you just take him out of your mind? So is that maybe a delusion that you are the thinker? And there has been a fascinating research done on that. Uh, thinking is quite programmed and quite conditioned. Do you think you would think the same if you had grown up in North Korea? Imagine if for whatever reason you had been adopted at one month age from a North Korean couple and then you had been brought up in that system. You would think very different. This is uh, some reflections uh, to approach uh, recognizing the delusion there. The other thing which a self is usually doing is, as I said, doing something. Now I'm the doer. And usually you never think that we control what we are doing. It's me in the doing my actions. How about toothpaste? Do you maybe have a Colgate toothpaste? Why don't you have a Vajradanti? I have a Vajradanti toothpaste. It's an Indian. Why don't you have that one? Why did you go to the shop and buy a Colgate? Because the advertisements are telling you. Ne? That's when you go up here and then you get all these advertisements, Colgate toothpaste. And that's what you're buying. 
So most why maybe not you making that decision. The chetana. Chetana is the wanting, volition, will, deciding what you do. Now I can think what I want, this is a delusion of I. I can decide what I want to do and then I do it. And then suddenly you find out you know, that this is all conditioned. And what you're doing is what the advertisements tell you and the party you're voting is what the propaganda is telling you. And the thinking is you know, what your mother told you and a little toddler and what they told you at school. And once we start you know, looking into that and you know, peeling that off, you, know, you notice this whole delusion you know, that I am the thinker, I can think what I like. I'm making decisions. There's been fascinating research you know, on this decision making. Whether we're able to uh, show that the a decision precedes the moment when people think that they are making them. They control that you know, with the brain scans and so on, and they control that the decision has been made already before the person even knows that they have made the decision. And once they're saying what they're doing, this is already, it's already determined the decision had occurred beforehand. If we are just you know, maintaining that delusion that this is me, the condition process, and then we put the delusion that I am all doing that, and that there's this you know, unchanging self which owns that and which is acting and thinking and doing and feeling. There's been research you know, with hypnosis, quite fascinating. As a person is hypnotized, and then they are told if uh, the hypnotizer is touching themselves you know, at the forehead, that is a signal. And then they have to climb on the table and sil uh, sing a silly song. And then they're told to forget about the instruction. And then the hypnotizer you know, touches his forehead when they are at a quite solemn or special occasion. And then because of the hypnosis and the instruction given, this person will climb on the table and start singing this silly song and making themselves no fool, look ridiculous. And the interesting thing is now, Nick, because I can't remember, they have been hypnotized, they've been told to forget it. The interesting thing is when you ask them now, why did you do that? It's extremely difficult to explain you because you make a complete fool of yourself. And they will always give a rational explanation. They will find some explanation why they have made the decision to do these foolish things and make themselves ridiculous. Challenging this um, convention uh, meeting or just trying to be funny to warm people up or whatever. Some excuse to maintain the delusion that is a self making the decision, that they themselves, I make this decision. That we all know from the setup that they knew, and it was simply an instruction and hypnosis. So, in the end, it's not an objective decision is there safe, is there no safe? It is simply up to us whether we want to maintain the delusion of self, whether we want to maintain the delusion of ownership and me and mine, or whether we want to practice to abandon it. Now you have the freedom. The Buddha can't take that freedom away from you, and both options are definitely possible. It's definitely possible to you know, maintain the delusion of self. We have been doing that for countless lifetimes through Sangsaba. This is how rebirth works. But we also have the other option and train ourselves to weaken and ultimately abandon that delusion of me, my, mine and self and I. And what the Buddha is saying, the one is just 
heaps of suffering, the other means you know, that you are free and released and that you are free of suffering. The result of maintaining the delusion of I, me and mine is just misery. The result of letting go of that delusion, comprehending it, seeing it with wisdom and abandoning it wisely resides in the end of suffering. And what is really ingenious in the Buddha's approach, even if people believe that there is the eternal soul somewhere, because many people have that in the back of their mind, that this eternal soul must be there somewhere, the Buddha doesn't challenge that directly. But he only directs you to investigate five things, whether they truly have the qualities a self should be having. For example, control. Ownership, self, and implies control. And these five things is the five groups of clinging. Number one form, the body. This is a very strong um, sense of self. Have you ever heard um, the term selfie? What's a selfie? No one knows what a selfie is. Yeah, it's a picture of your body, isn't it? It's not, it's not a picture of your feelings. It's not a picture of your intentions. It's just a picture of your body. We literally call it a selfie. So you can see now how powerful the identification is with form, with the body. It's actually the main trunk. If anyone could fully abandon all delusion of I, self, mine regarding the body, if someone didn't think or feel or appropriate in any which way the body as I, me, I'm the body, this is my body, the body is mine, the body is myself, if someone were completely free from that, is already the third stage of enlightenment, anagamita, non-return, out of four in the stages of a realization of awakening, already number three. So the Buddha recommends you know, to check out is there maybe a contradiction in regarding the body as safe. It's not an objective decision now, is the body safe or not safe? It is a point that, that we are making the body safe, that we are making it mine. We are appropriating the body. And like a thief. <laughs> Thieves just go around, uh, burglars are back in your house and they take some of your stuff and then they just consider it as theirs. So we walk around and we just take earth, water, heat and wind out of nature because that is our whole, whole body, it consists of that. And then just like a thief, and we got this suddenly as mine. Although the air goes in and out all the time. The water goes in and out all the time. The heat goes in and out all the time. Quite, quite uh, funny, if you think about it, and it's quite uh, amazing how that delusion can be maintained. And as the Buddha says in the sutta, which you'll be chanting, 1.30, Rupanche hidang bikave atta abavisa na yidang rupang abadhaya sangvateya. Now, if the body was your eternally blissful soul, it, it wouldn't lead no, to uh, sickness and illness. It wouldn't have to be operated on. An eternally blissful soul no, doesn't need an operation. It's eternal and blissful, so the body obviously can't be that. The body is not what will be chucked into the coffin one day and then either into the earth or being burned. It is not the eternally blissful, everlasting soul, obviously. 
And so we drop the body. It doesn't have that quality. It also doesn't have the quality of being mine. Because if it's mine, I should be able to control it. Can you make your body 20 years younger, 30 years younger? Can you make your body healthy if it's sick? Can you just will that? No, that means that the body is not under our control. The body is impermanent, it will perish. We can't control it and we can't determine how tall exactly, what complexion. You, you can fiddle around to some extent. You can, not saying you can't do nothing, but there's a, you know, severe limitations how much we can make the body the way we like it. And so the Buddha asked, now, is, is it a smart idea to regard it as mine and as safe? If it's impermanent, if it's out of control, is it suitable to regard it as me and mine? Is it helpful? Will that lead to your peace and uh, happiness? And the monks answer, no, obviously, obviously not, Bhante as it is impermanent and out of control and changing and getting sick and so on. It's not a good idea to regard it as safe. Instead, the Buddha recommends das Mati Hebekeve Yankinchi Rupang Atita Nagata Pachupanang Achatangva Bahitava Ulari Kangva Sukumangva Inangva Pani Tangva Yangdure Santikeva Sapang Rupang Ne Tang Mama Ne So Hamasmi Na Me So Atanti Whatever form, whatever body, near or far very beautiful, young, radiant, old and decrepit, and whether in the refined or coarse, whether it's some spirit or deva or brahma, or whether it's a coarse human or animal body, whatever body, whether internally in this body I'm walking around with, or the body of other people, no, all bodies whatsoever, all form whatsoever. Netang Mama, this is not mine. Neso Hamasmi, this is not me. I am not this. Nameso Atati, this is not myself. Evang Etang. Yatabutang samapanyayadatabang. Just so it should be regarded with proper wisdom according to reality as it truly is. I really love that. It's like a little mantra. Netang mama neso amasmi nameso atati. And again, applicable. You apply that to something. You don't think in the abstract, is there a safe, is there no safe? But you apply it to this body. And if you go into an operation and you prepare yourself by Netang Mama Neso Hamasmi Nameso Atati, this body is not really me. I don't really own this body. This body is not myself, this body is not I you go much more relaxed into the operation. And if you can uh, truly understand it with proper wisdom as it really is, now then we are completely free of, of any problem with the body. We wouldn't be afraid of dying anymore. The same with feeling. Pleasant, unpleasant, painful. The feeling, Vedana. This is me. I'm in pain. I'm so much pain. 
can feel immediately, you know, this strong I, me, my, my pain, my misery, or my happiness. At the moment, as there's misery, misery, and you hold on to it as me and mine, then it's real misery. It gets worse straight away. It's a multiplicator. You can multiply your suffering there. If you have ten units of pain and thousand units of ego, you have to multiply that a thousand times. Ten is ten thousand. Ooh, lots of pain. If you have hundred points of pain, ten times worse pain, so to speak, and zero ego, what is hundred by zero? Zero, yes. No suffering, even with the pain, because not your pain. The same with perception. Good, bad, right, wrong, enemy, friend, loved one, this is all perceptions. Or can we let go of that? Can we see the moment uh, this is me, you know, that I, I like that music, uh, I like that kind of person, I have these friends, you know, this is how we define ourselves. This is where so much argument comes from. As a real good exercise for letting go of perception, a time ago, and I gave that a try, there's this website, uh, International Movie Database, IMDB, I think, imdb.com, where they basically have uh, reviews and descriptions and trivia about all movies. So if you have a favorite movie, and you could go there and look at that. And very known movies, and they often have thousands of reviews which people send in. And very nicely, you can actually toggle the reviews that they start and with the um, highest rating first, or that the reviews start with the lowest rating first. So now go to your favorite movie, your absolute top movie, and toggle the reviews that the least favorite rating come, f come first. And even the most famous movie with the most famous director will have plenty of people who give that only one out of ten stars and who are really upset and who are writing that this movie is unbelievably boring, the story doesn't make any sense, the director is a disaster, the actors don't know how to act. And this is your favorite movie. And you will have a big clash of Sonia. This is all Sonia, what is written in the review. And your views, and there's also views, no, but you also have your Sonia's, your perception of that movie, and it will be the opposite. And you will notice the identification. You will notice the agitation. If you're not into movies, but you're maybe in a Buddhist with a strong faith and confidence, you can also go to Jehovah's Witness and join a reading on the Buddhism exposed, the Buddhism refuted. <laughs> can you sit through that? without getting agitated and upset. Or put in a movie you really hate and toggle that you get the top reviews first and they will praise it to the moon. And every single word will contradict your perception. And you will see the identification with that, now, my perception, I know what this movie is like, now, I know who is white and uh, this is white and this is wrong. Lots of conflict and suffering. If you don't hold to, in, to it as I and mine, 
that you can just read that or listen to that and no agitation. The next one is Chetana, volition, intention. We already talked about that. No? You can't even think what you want to think. <laughs> you don't even have control of our, of our thoughts. You don't even have control of our actions. Or let's say in a limited control, not total control. So how can we regard that really as I, me and mine? And then finally, consciousness. No. I consciousness and all these forms we are aware of. Your consciousness, the sounds we are aware of, mind consciousness, thoughts and ideas we are conscious of. The same applies. Investigate it, see it as impermanent, as changing is not under our control and uh, it becomes apparent that there's no point in regarding that as me and mine because it just leads to disappointment and suffering. Another really good trick is what the Buddha has found outside of these five body in the form feeling perception, intention, and consciousness. Outside of these five groups, you cannot have any delusion of self. If you can let go of these five, then your mind is completely liberated and free. The delusion of self and it needs a pop-up. It has to be popped up by something. And it has to be these five, nor any combination of them. So the moment when you can let go of these five groups, the delusion of self collapses, the delusion of ownership collapses, the notion of me, I, and mine, and it can no longer be maintained, and the heart is free. And doesn't really matter whether you think there's a safe or there's no safe. <laughs> it doesn't really matter whether you believe that there's an eternal soul somewhere. All you have to do is investigating these five, and that's very concrete, very specific, and can be done by anyone. You can even put the question aside whether there is some eternal soul somewhere, whether there is a safe somewhere, and you can just say, okay. Don't worry about that. I just look whether any of these five could be a safe. And you investigate these five groups, form, feeling, perception, intention, consciousness, and you can drop them. And outside of that, no delusion of self can be maintained anywhere. You're free, liberated. Art has attained Nibbana just from that much. So if after this talk you feel still not quite clear how does it all work with uh, safe and not safe, and don't worry so much, don't think about it much, but just investigate these five groups and whether that makes any sense, whether it's a smart idea to regard any of these five groups as me, mine, and safe and check out whether it feels better if you can drop them even just partially. Because that is all that is required. That is all to undermine and eliminate the delusion of self, seeing that it's not these five. And outside of that, no, no delusion of self could be maintained anyhow when you're free.